You are now tuned into LA Talk Live. We're more than just talk. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. You know the bed feels warmer sleeping here alone. You know I dream in color and do the things I want. Hi everybody, this is Lucinda Bassett and you're listening to Truth Be Told and we are here at LA Talk Live, yay! Call in to talk to us today at 323-247-7443 and we're talking about a very interesting topic today. We're talking about ADHD, um, ADD and ADHD, but we're really going to focus on uh, ADHD, which is... Um, ADHD is something that's very interesting. It stands for Attention Deficit Disorder with Hyperactivity or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And I happen to be an expert on that too, believe it or not. I happen to be an expert on so many things. Um, But because my beautiful, amazing, gorgeous son, Samuel, uh, Sammy, who might be calling in this hour if he has time when he gets out of class, um, had ADHD. And ADHD uh, is more common in guys than girls. And statistically speaking, um, the exact cause of it is unknown. They believe that there's a genetic de- uh, component there, predisposition that possibly you had a family member with something similar, or there might be a neurotransmitter function that could be involved. They even believe that sometimes in pregnancy, if you have certain complications, it could cause um, the unborn child to have ADHD and possibly even Tourette syndrome. So, and by the way, it's not uncommon for someone to have ADHD and Tourette syndrome, which uh, my son Sammy actually had. Um, so, what are the symptoms of ADHD? And I think I think the gray area for parents is that little boys are <laughs> kind of wound up anyway. And as a mom who um, sat there with a first grader who couldn't sit still, was going around tapping people on the head, couldn't do his arithmetic, was really, really good at uh, bad, I'm, I'm sorry, bad at multiplication tables, um, and, and just really had a hard time um, um, focusing. Um, you know, when we first went to the doctor, the very first thing they said was ADHD, let's put them on meds. And then you have to struggle with, do I really want my kid on meds? And then you've got the teachers who are out there saying, will you please put that kid on meds? He's driving me crazy. He's disrupting the class. He talks all the time. And so as a mom who went through this, all the way through some, my son's college experience, and he happens to be in college now, thriving, finally found his place in culinary school. Yay! And he's getting A's. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, I went through a life, my son's 21 now, but let me tell you something. I went through years of, of can I say the word hell on this show, with Sammy uh, when he was diagnosed at first with ADHD and then Tourette syndrome. But let's just talk about ADHD. So what are the symptoms? Careless mistakes, lack of attention to details, uh, inability to sustain attention, poor listener, fail, failure to follow through on tasks, poor organizational skills, avoiding tasks that require sustained mental effort, losing things, easily distracted, forgetful, um, squirming, leaving their seat, difficulty sitting with quiet activities, always on the go, excessive talking, blurting things out, can't sit still. I remember when Sammy was in the third, does that sound like you, huh? You relate to that? Um, and you're, if you're sitting at home listening, you probably have had, if you have a son, you relate to that. Um, because there are a lot of boys that have a real difficult time focusing, sitting still, and behaving. And so if you really need to um, get help, if, if your child is at the point where they're really disruptive in class, they aren't doing their work at their level. Another thing is dysgraphia. A lot of kids who have attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder have bad handwriting or it's difficult handwriting. So here you have a poor kid who can't focus, can't sit still, doesn't listen well. They're distracted and their handwriting's terrible and they're not good with multiplications. What are they going to do? Well, like, likely they're going to end up in the principal's office a lot, or they're going to end up picking their nose or, you know, picking on someone else because they're totally frustrated. And it's it's such a difficult thing for a parent. It's such a difficult thing for the child. And um, 
And yet more than 15 million Americans are estimated to be affected with ADHD. Five million of them are school-aged children. Ten million of them, believe it or not, are 18 and above. And so, you know, you're looking at a huge amount of the population. And what is the method of treatment for attention to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Well, there are a lot of medications out there right now, and that's controversial. Um, there are people that believe when you put a kid on a very small dose of a stimulant, because that's what they use to control their ADHD, they're going to grow up with problems. They're going to grow up with a tendency to want to use medications to self-medicate. Uh, that could be anything from cocaine to to marijuana to, you know, ecstasy to, you know, um, um, oh, what's the one I'm thinking of, right? You know, the, uh, there are so many medications that kids, when they're old enough to find these drugs on their own, will go out and find them. The unfortunate thing is that for f f these medications can really be helpful if they're used properly and they're titrated by a really great psychiatrist who really understands and understands that your child does have attention deficit disorder. And we're going to have the opportunity to talk to uh, just that person in a few minutes. But um, and we're going to have someone joining us who, who struggled with ADHD and I believe was put on medication throughout his life, right, Matt? Yeah. And was frustrated with his parents as a result of being on medication. And yet, you know, in my life, my son um, went through school. He was on and off of very, very small doses. I'm not going to name the brand of a stimulant. And, you know, five milligrams. And you know what? Did it calm him down in class? Yeah. Yes. Did it make him a little bit able more to do his work? Yes. But... By the time he got home, he was I, I had him working with a tutor. He would run around the table, he would throw pencils at her, he would rip up, you know, paper balls and throw those at her. And he was he was it was almost impossible to get him to sit down, function, and do his own homework. And 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 as a parent, I struggled because you'd go into the classroom and you'd see these other kids who could just sit there and behave and be quiet. And I was a classroom mommy. I, I, I was there, you know, I was the party mommy, the classroom mommy. I did it all. But I would sit over there and watch, you know, Johnny Smith in his perfect handwriting, and he could sit there and listen to the teacher, and I'd see my son pulling at his hair, picking at his nose, messing with his feet, drawing pictures. He couldn't write. You know, he had his handwriting was terrible. And so somewhere about second grade, third grade, I thought, well, you know, this kid needs accommodations. So then you go through that, you know. And um, it's just a, that in itself is a nightmare. Your kid needs psychological testing. Then you end up going to doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists. You're on and off trying different medications. They give them accommodations. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Some t and then for Sammy, about second grade, he was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. And um, Tourette syndrome, as I said, in ADHD, can have common symptoms where uh, they blurt things out, they go around touching other people, they don't have the ability to sit still, and and you know it's a very very difficult and challenging thing for for a child. So that's what we're talking about this hour. So if you or someone you know or love um, struggles with ADHD, if you're an adult, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear how you handled it. We're going to be giving you some um, advice and coping skills if you have a grade school child or a, a, a middle school or teenager with ADHD, some of the things that you can do to help them, believe it or not, that are more organic. And we're, he we're here to tell you also that medication can be very, very effective. Again, it was interesting. Sammy went off to, to university and didn't do well, and a lot of it was because Poor Sammy, you know, didn't, he's not good at taking notes and he's not good at sitting still. He was not good at being in college. And then we tried another school that might, we thought would be a little easier for him and that didn't do well for him either. And then he approached me about a year ago and said, you know what, I think I want to go to culinary school. And it's like, culinary school, huh, okay. His dad loved to cook. His sister went to culinary school. I'm a good cook. And lo and behold, you know, he enrolled in a culinary school about a year ago and he's getting straight A's. He's the teacher's pet. The teachers love him because he's working with his hands and he's doing something that's fun and he can handle the academia of it because it's, you know, manageable. And he's thriving. Now he's saying he wants to go into their four-year program. So I think a lot of it is just understanding that not every kid is a square peg fitting into a square hole and that if you can find out why they're unique and get the right help, um, then that is so much of it. So I think we're going to have this um, 
wonderful psychiatrist join us now. His name is uh, is Dr. Dale Archer. Um, Dr. Archer, are you with us? I am, yes. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? <laughs> We're glad you're here. I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to figure out where I, I'm reading through your bio. You're in private practice and also, um, I know you've been on, and, and I believe you still have your own radio show. Tell us a little bit about you, where you live, what you do, and, and are you still in private practice? Yeah, I uh, live in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and I own a clinic there, um, which is a, a large clinic. We have about six psychiatrists and some psychologists and social workers and therapists, and I still see patients, but the bulk of my work is uh, I'm the administrator for the clinic, and uh, and then I also um, am pursuing writing books. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. I, I, well, I've written four books, so if you need any advice or guidance, you know I'm here. <laughs> well, I just finished my first one, uh, Yay! which was published uh, last year. Okay. And, uh, I'm working on the second one now. Okay, so what is the title of your book that's out now? Uh, the, the book that went out last year is called Better Than Normal, How What Makes You Different Can Make You Exceptional. Oh, I love that title. Yeah. And what is that book about? Well, it's basically saying that uh, we as a society have become overdiagnosed, overmedicated, and overtreated with respect to psychiatric conditions. Mm -hmm. And that, unfortunately, over the last 30 years, it's gravitated to such that based on the DSM manual that psychiatric conditions come with an on-off switch. Yes. With four or five of eight symptoms, you've got a diagnosis. Four of eight, you don't. So the book basically says, look, these, it takes eight psychiatric diagnoses and looks at them in terms of these being a trait that occurs along a continuum and says, if you're on a scale of one to 10 and you've got you say ADHD at the 9, 10, 10 plus range, then you probably have a real diagnosis and need to be treated. On the other hand, we're diagnosing people along that continuum who have a four or a five or a six. And not only is that not a psychiatric diagnosis, but it also can be your greatest strength. Huh. I love that. And that's so true. And, and so I'm assuming you've done quite a bit of work with people with ADHD. Yes, I have. And I'm assuming a lot of that has been frustrated parents who've come to you to help them with their children who've been diagnosed with ADHD. It's it's kids, you know, um, I mean, after the revision of the DSM back in 2000, where all of a sudden there's adult attention deficit disorder, right. and a lot of adults are coming in saying, yeah, I read about this. I really think I've got it. I need something to help me focus better or something to help me uh, not be such a procrastinator. So, you know, it's both, we, kids and, and parents and, and adults. Well, you know, the, the, and I, first of all, I so, I so much appreciate your time because um, as a mother who raised a son who was ADHD and also had Tourette's, had, I say, still has, but the sim he's really pr kind of symptom-free, thank God. But uh, the struggle that you have as a parent and maybe not so much as an adult, but as a parent, you have this innocent, you know, third grader sitting there who's a little bundle of energy with a great attitude, who's, you know, clicking along, a little bit irritating, talking too much, annoying, difficult to sit in a classroom with 30 kids. And and all of a sudden you put him on these medications, and I'm not going to name brands, but you know the stimulants that that they put these kids on. And by the way, they can calm that that child down. They do seem to be able to maybe focus a little bit better. But without question, there's an after effect. You know, when they, I mean, as they wear off the kid, my son became more hyper. They also caused depression. They caused other symptoms in him. And he became agitated. And I, I just didn't like the side effects. And there's such a gray area. And you feel so guilty as a parent putting your kid on medication. And I mean, and and yet there's this pressure from, from some of these teachers, because so many of these kids are on medication, that they, they actually kind of encourage you to put them on medication. What is your opinion of all of that? It's so crazy as a parent to make the right decisions. You, you know, you've hit on so many points to address. I'm trying to decide. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little. <laughs> first, but let me tell you that my new book that I'm working on now, the title is The ADHD Advantage. So that's great. Um, that's I am great. researching that and, and writing even as we speak. Let me just say that the, the whole system of diagnosing and treating ADHD is broken. 
It's broken from top to bottom. The diagnosis didn't even exist until 1980. Wow. Okay. Huh. All of a sudden, this diagnosis came out of the blue to be able to deal with kids that were behavioral problems, and they were given the ADD diagnosis. And now, as of last year, we had 5 million kids, which works out to be more guys than girls, but about one in nine guys, little boys, have this diagnosis. And okay. about 50% of these are medicated. And the number one predictor of who gets medication is the teacher. The teacher is making the call because, wow. look, we know a lot of teachers are overworked and they're stressed. And you've got a little guy that won't sit still, and it's a lot easier for them to get this kid on medication. And, of course, the parents are often guilted into it. That's exactly right. The, yeah. yeah, they're told, yeah. well, look, you're, you're not helping your son. You're not being a good mother because if he could sit still and focus, he would be a better student. Right. He would have better self-esteem right. and on and on and on. But lost in this whole madness is the fact we're not looking at where these folks end up. And we're not telling them, you know what, you're three times more likely to start your own business if you have ADHD. And Richard Branson and David Nealman, the founder of uh, JetBlue, and John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, and Michael Jordan, and Michael Phelps. Huh. And I mean, I could just go on and on and on. You know All what? of these talk about their ADHD. Well, I, Howard I, Mandel, I just did an interview with him last week about his ADHD. And I they don't... talk about not only the fact that they had the diagnosis, but how bad they felt because they were different and they knew it. And only as they got older and successful did they look back and say, you know what? I am who I am because of that. Right. And it's not a diagnosis. It's a trait that made me who I am. And David Nealman said, if I had a magic pill then or now to take to make it go away, I wouldn't do it. Right. But right. we're not telling the kids that. Right. And we're not telling the parents that. Well, the thing that's interesting is uh, in my last book, The Solution, um, I opened the book with uh, a list of about 30 celebrities who either suffered from ADHD or depression or anxiety disorder or even bipolar disorder, you know, like Ted Turner, and, and went on to be extremely successful, in fact, probably because of the disorder, and turned it around and used it produ productively as, a pos as opposed to saying there's something wrong with me. In fact, there's a lot right with you because you are – you know, high, strong, high energy that you think out of the box, you, you think differently, you see things differently. Um, and, and I tried to really embrace that with my son, Sammy, but the problem, and I love, by the way, I love what you do because it's what I do. It's like, let's change the, in, that's what I did, in fact, with my book, From Panic to Power. I said, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with you because you have anxiety and disorder. In fact, there's a lot right with you. You know, you're you're in, you're intelligent. You're creative. You have a vivid imagination. You're intellectual. You know, you're you're a thinker. You're and and let's show you how to take that energy and that creativity where you're using it now to be a warrior and turn it around and put it outward where it belongs and use it to make your dreams come true. And so what you're saying is is similar. It's, let's take this beautiful little boy who's in the third grade can't sit still and he's fidgety and, he, and he, maybe he's got dysgraphia and maybe he talks a lot and let's you know find a place where they'll embrace him or you find a way for him to embrace himself and that's such a beautiful thing but as you said when you're the teacher and you got 35 students um, and you're the mommy going, look, I, you know, I'm not giving him sugar. He's eating organic food. He goes to bed at night. He exercises. But, you know, this is who he is biochemically, neurologically, genetically. And it's, it's, it's then what do you do? Well, I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, actually, it's interesting to, to hear about your books because it's very similar to my first book where I did take the eight traits, which included anxiety, bipolar uh, narcissism, and looked at those and said, we're going to look at what's good about each and every one of these traits. Yeah, I love but, that. Love that. I, yeah, yeah, getting back to, to ADHD, you know, I, I think that the, the, the important point, and, and unfortunately, we were really hoping that the DSM-5 was going to address some of this, but, but it's fallen woefully short by all reports, is that 
Psychiatric diagnoses don't come with an on-off switch. They occur along a continuum. So if you have a severe ADHD on a scale of 1 to 10 that's right up there at 10, or even in my ranking system, I'll give them a 10 plus, then they may need medications. I'm not anti-meds, but unfortunately, it's become the de facto trigger for right. treatment. ADHD, right. medication. Right. It, you know, one follows the other. And so I think we need to revisit and say, we have to quantify where along this continuum this child falls and then ask ourselves, what are the other types of interventions that we can do? What are the positive things that we can do? And then the med needs to be a last resort after everything else. So so let me, let me go back to, I want to go back to the very first thing you said, which would be then for the parents that are listening or even if you're an adult or a college student. But first of all, it's extremely important to get the proper diagnosis. So you need to go to probably a psychiatrist and don't just go to your family doctor. Or, I mean, really get the proper diagnosis so that you really understand that this is the problem, number one, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it, it's the type of thing where when you're talking about putting your child on a psychostimulant, a very powerful medication, you certainly want to go to an expert. So I think family practitioners and pediatricians are great for a lot of things. But I got to say to everyone out there, you want an expert in this diagnosis if medication is a possibility. And that's not so hard to find anymore. You go on Google, okay? Go on Yelp.com. You know, you Google psychiatrists who work with ADHD in your area. You'll find it. And that is part of the beauty of the internet. And then also, you know, they can pick up your book, but I, but I, what I want to do is, so the first thing and most, first and foremost, don't, if you if the teacher comes out and says, put Johnny on medication or goes talk to your doc, you know what, you just take a breath and you slow down and you know, as the mother, parent, father, you're in charge, not your teacher. And, and so don't be intimidated by the teacher and make sure you go to a professional, more than likely a pediatric psychiatrist uh, or even a neurologist, I don't know, that's going to understand ADHD and you really think before you put them on medication because, as you just said, Dr. Archer, there are other alternatives. I want to take one minute and let's talk about, uh, as you said, medication is the last resort and we will talk about that. But what can you do, organically speaking, to help that child so they don't end up with a low self-esteem, maybe to help the class understand or the teacher understand, but most importantly, to help that child? If you don't have the money to go to a private school that specializes in kids with, with behavioral right. disorders, all right, which most people don't have that money. So you're, you know, now you're talking to Susan Smith, who lives in Ohio, and her kid's in a classroom that's overcrowded. She's got a frustrated teacher, and, and there sits Johnny, feeling bad about about himself because he's got bad handwriting. He can't focus. He can't listen. He's getting D's. What do we do for him organically or just, you know, from a natural perspective, what can we do? Well, th there are several things. Uh, first of all, right off the bat, is that we know that kids who have the ADHD trait really do well and calm down and focus better with exercise. So, uh, you know, any type of exercise, whether it be an organized school activity, you can get your child in. And of course, unfortunately, a lot of schools have done away with PE, um, which really helped these kids a lot. Right. And so that's number one, you know, some type of exercise every single day will make a big, big difference. Can I number just, I want to, I want to add one thing there. Yeah. Uh, I hired a college student to come to my house and swim with my son, okay? Wow. Now, I happen to I happen to be ha well, and I know not everybody can afford to do that, and not everybody's got a sure, pool in their backyard. That's a great idea. But I I figured that out. And I I put I did have a pool in my backyard. We moved into this house with a pool, and I hired a college student. It was very cheap, and he was on the swim team, and I had him swim the heck out of my son when he got home from school. My son ended up by the way, on the water polo team for a major high school, and he's one of the top players as a result of me trying to calm him down. <laughs> so, and if you did the right thing, maybe you didn't know why it worked, but it worked. Yeah, so what's, and so number two. Okay, now, number two is, um, well, of course, I, I wanna say that, then this goes for all psychiatric conditions, and it's not talked about nearly enough, but exercise, sleep, and diet right. for any type of condition. You know, if we all think, oh, well, that's for physical. That's for physical health. That has nothing to do with my mental health. Wrong, mm -hmm. wrong. 
Mm-hmm. So I, the, it goes without saying, you know, a healthy diet and, of course, a, a regimented sleep time. But let's get to the how these kids learn. Okay, ADHD, you need to think of that as being a diagnosis of being bored easily with routine. So the reason these kids are acting up and they're getting up and they're moving around and they can't sit still for the hour class and on and on is because they're bored. And if you can get them focused and not bored, then they're going to do fine. How do we do that? Number one, and these schools you talked about, these high-end schools, this is what they do. Rather than have an hour of history and an hour of reading and an hour of math, they'll do 15 minutes of history followed immediately by 15 minutes of math, and it's fast paced. So you can do that. If you can't do it at the school, you can certainly do it with homework. Right. And also, you know, the old mantra of, you know, in a nice, quiet spot, you got to focus for 30 minutes on this for your homework and then this. That's out the window. ADHD, these folks are great with multitasking. They may study better with the TV on or in a room where everyone else is talking Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you give them 10 minutes of math and then you jump to another subject and you kind of rotate for that because they can focus initially. Then the brain starts to go, hmm, yeah, this is kind of boring. I want to do something else. And you give them another subject. So, you know, those are some of the examples. But I think the most important is to have that talk where you don't label them as right. someone mm-hmm. who has a mental illness mm-hmm. and is going to be, you know, trying to overcome that the rest of their life. Rather, you say, you know, Michael Phelps was, was really fascinating when he said, look, it, I, I needed an outlet because I knew I was scattered and couldn't focus. And so for me, swimming was that, uh, gave me that ability to kind of calm down and to focus, and then of course I found that the you know the more I swam, the better I felt, and the better everything else fell into place. And he goes, the ADHD is really what drove me right. into the swimming. Right. So um, that's what we got to do with our kids is we got to tell them this isn't a weakness. Look, these are the strengths that go. In. You're great at multitasking. You're incredibly resilient. Fascinating study. It was college students just came out saying those with ADHD, and we would think it would be the exact opposite, are more resilient when bad things happen, when negative stressors occur. They bounce back quicker. Huh. And this is when they're not medicated. They looked at kids, college kids, medic, I mean, not medicated, who had ADHD and who didn't. They're very good with deadlines because they'll wait to the last minute. True. But then they can really focus to be able to, to plow through. So, I mean, the advantages go on and on and on. That's what we have to tell our kids. You know, and see, I love that because I, I did. I spent I spent 21 years telling my son, it, and, and it is a wonderful thing to do, telling my son, you are, you know, you're, you're, you're so smart and you're so creative and, and you're so talented. And, and, but it, it's so hard when you are the parent and you have the teacher saying, your kid's a problem. Your, and then your, your, your kid comes home with a D on his test. And then you, there's so much focus anymore. You know, it's so horrible on you've got to get your kid into the best kindergarten. Then you got to get your kid in the best grade school. Then they got to, so they can eventually get into the best college. As a, <laughs> and, and there's all that pressure that's associated with growing your child. And, and then you turn around and Mary's child seems to be better behaved than yours in the play group. And they don't want your. And so, yes, it, it's 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 a, it, it all sounds good and it looks good on paper. But as a parent who's been there, it's so hard because and you, I even did try one of those expensive schools that know how to work with kids with ADHD and they didn't even do a good job with it. I love what you're saying. I think I think what you what you really have to do is is first of all, get the proper diagnosis. And then if it is diagnosed that he or she has ADHD, then take a breath. And I think they need to buy your book. And I think they need to go on the internet and find everything they can. You need to really make sure that your child gets a good night's rest. Make sure the teacher understands that your child is amazing, but they do struggle because of the ADHD. And then how do we deal with the D's? And the uh, F's and the, 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 the two page paper that's that by Timmy is only a paragraph because that's all he's got the attention to write. Well, f- first of all, it, they've been there have been studies that, that have looked at uh, using these psychostimulants and the, and 
the bottom line is they do improve performance, they do improve grades, and they do improve test scores. But okay. here's the kicker. They do it across the board for all kids, not just kids with ADHD. Oh, wow. Anybody you give a psychostimulant to is going to perform better on a test that you have to sit and focus and concentrate on. Huh. So the thing is, how to what lengths do we want to go for our kids to make good grades? You know, is giving them a powerful psychostimulant what we want? Well, if that's the case, well, then we should give it to so-called kids with normal, average, quote unquote, right. who don't have ADHD because their scores and their grades are going to get better too. Well, I you, think it's a huge philosophical question that we're dealing with yeah. for our culture and our society. And of course, you know, I, I agree with you completely. I just wrote a, a blog for Psychology Today, actually exactly what you're talking about, about the push, the drive that, you know, everyone has to go to college and not only go to college, you got to go to a good college and the better right. college you go to, the better you're going to do. Right. So therefore you got to make good grades. Right. And you're right. And the pressure starts Lord. at a very young age. And right. I think that is just a skewed mindset. Well, and I want to say this, um, you know, my daughter went to Georgetown business school. She was the top of her class. And then my son, you know, couldn't write a paper and they both came from two, the same parents. And we were, you know, we were both bright and good parents and they both ate the same food. <laughs> they lived in the same house. Okay. But Sammy was biochemically neurologically different and sure. and so what i did is i just embraced his difference i never compared him to my daughter and i could get a, i didn't care less where he went to college i wanted him to go but there even came a point in the last year couple years where I thought, you know, he may not be cut out for college. And so I think so much of it is, is really, you know, um, finding the places where they shine. Sammy happened to shine in water polo. So that's where he shined, you know, and, and, and Sammy liked to play music. And so that's what Sammy did. And, and so not everyone has to go to a Georgetown or a, you know, Harvard or, I mean, it, it's really, I think a lot of it is, is about embracing who, who they are as an individual and, and, and allowing them to show you, you know, who they're going to be. And as long as you are a good parent and a good example and something else I said that uh, you said, I think that's so important is their diet. Um, two things that were very significant with Sammy. One is being strict. You know, you, you really have to set rules and boundaries and you have to be really clear. And that's so important with any, with any child, but especially in a, in one with ADHD and, uh, and behavior, they have to be, you know, rewarded for good behavior and they have to be, I don't want to use the word punished, but they, they have to understand what's okay. What's not okay. What's impolite, what's good grace, you know, good behavior. Um, and, and there has to be boundaries and, and really strict guidelines and you have to really stick to that. And the other thing is diet is so important and you mentioned it, but you didn't go into detail, but I know, for example, if my son drank a glass of orange juice, he was, he was over the top crazy. I mean, so talk to us about diet with, with a child who is, who is ADHD. Well, you know, there, there's a lot, boy, there's a lot of, of uh, research that's going on with that. And, and here's the deal. When it comes to something, for example, like refined sugar, which my opinion is that none of us should be putting that in our body, period, end of story. But when they look at kids with ADHD versus other kids, again, you're not seeing this big discrepancy between, okay, kids with ADHD and have sugar and they're bouncing off the walls and other kids don't. That's wrong. I mean, sugar is not healthy for you, period. But, but the important thing is it's going to affect each of us differently. So one kid may be able to drink, a, you know, three Cokes and really it doesn't affect them that much. Another kid may have half a Coke and they're bouncing off the wall. Again, what you have to do is you have to know your child. Right. And you have to understand, like in your case, if he has the orange juice, you're going, okay, you know what? A lot of sugar in there. So clearly for him, and a lot of times what I tell, you know, and I tell parents this, but I also tell patients this, that it's trial and error, that you want the healthy diet and you want to go and get, you know, from the, from the saturated fats to the refined sugars, you want to take that out, but you're going to find individually that, for you, some of those things are going to be much more important than others. And, and right now, we don't have the ability to be able to say, okay, on all people, this is going to be a problem if you have sugar. You know what? On some people, it will. Some, not so much. 
So at the end of the day, it's going to be trial and error for each individual until we get more definitive research on the topic. Well, when is it time? When is it really time to consider medication? I, mean, I would say that the first thing, obviously, as a parent, we talked about the diet, we talked about exercise, we talked about sleep, we talked about uh, different study habits. You know, perhaps if there are some school options, you want to look at that. Then you, your next step would be therapy. You know, if you tried all that and your child is still having trouble, a lot of times you can start with the school psychologist or the school therapist, and they will provide this, and it will be free. And my view on that is that's more self-esteem work than everything else when you, when you get the, the child with the ADHD in therapy. But let's say you've tried all of that. And, and nothing has worked, and he's still a behavior problem, he's about to get kicked out of school, then I think, at least as a parent, you can comfort yourself with the fact that you didn't have a knee-jerk reaction and start popping pills down his throat. You, you tried the other alternatives, the other option. Nothing seemed to be working. Now, if you do get to that point, then, and the medication started, there's some things even then you want to be aware of. A, you want to try to do weekend holidays. So if he needs it at school, maybe he doesn't need it on the weekend. Huh. Summer holidays or when they're on off and taking a, a, a holiday vacation for Christmas or Thanksgiving. Take him off of it. The le wow. Well, again, you want to, the less they're on it, the better off overall. Now, some kids are so far at that 10 plus extreme they may need to be on meds all the time. So I'm not telling everyone out there meds are never to be looked at. But I am saying you want to make it the last option after you've exhausted everything else. Okay. And I, and I think, too, it, it is a little scary because there are long-term side effects of some of these medications that I've read about. Uh, and and I, I know when I put my son on medication, and again, it, you know that... The biggest problem isn't really the kid with ADHD. As a parent of a, of a son who had ADHD and Tourette's, the biggest problem is being a parent who has a child with ADHD who feels, you know, um, so so badly that you want your child to fit in. You want him to have friends and play dates. You want him to fit into the classroom. You want your teacher to like your child. You want your right. child to have a good self-esteem and come home with a, an A on his test like Stevie beside him did. And so that's where you get tripped up. It's that it's that whole feeling of it's almost like your reflection as a parent, and I hate to say this, is how your son or daughter is doing as a student or how they are, you know, fitting into the social network in your community. And unfortunately, ADHD, you know, is 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 a behavior that uh, uh, makes a lot of people not like your child. And then it ends up making your child feel bad about themselves. But um, we have to go to a break here. Um, I I am so, you know what? Can you just hang on for one minute? Because I want to come back and just make sure I get your books and everything out there again for you yeah, one more time. Sure, okay, got to. we'll be back in a minute. Thank you. You're with okay. Lucinda Bassett. This is LA Talk Live, and this is Truth Be Told. Meet Betsy. She is 29 years old and lives in Los Angeles. Recently, Betsy sent her father an email that brought tears of joy to his eyes. You see, Betsy suffers from autism, and this was the first email she had ever sent to anyone. Betsy is just one of the many students at Empower Tech, a nonprofit organization in Los Angeles that trains persons living with a broad range of physical, cognitive, and developmental disabilities how to use computers to do the things that so many of us take for granted. Email, online banking, research, and entertainment. Through modern assistive technology, instructors at Empower Tech help hundreds of people just like Betsy every year. They teach them the basic skills required to function independently in 21st century society. But with new state budget cuts, all of that could change. Empower Tech needs your help if it's going to continue making a difference here in our community. Please visit www.empowertech.org. That's www.empowertech.org to make a secure, 
tax-deductible contribution. And to learn more about this important community resource and to see for yourself what some of the amazing students and teachers do on a daily basis. Betsy and the 1.8 million people living with disabilities in Los Angeles County, thank you for caring enough to show your support. Hi, this is Romy Klinger. This is Rose Garcia. And we are inviting you to join us for the Romy and Rose Show every Friday at 4 p.m. Tune in for the Romy and Rose Show. We're going to be talking about pop culture, dating, business 101, what's ratchet, what's not ratchet, and music, and so much more. So don't forget, tune in to the Romy and Rose Show. It's about to get real. Exclusively on LATalkLive.com. You can also catch us on iTunes Radio, R&B, or watch us on Ustream.tv. Reality show handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is LA Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. We're real talk. You think you got the best of me. Think you've had the last laugh. Bet you think that everything good is gone. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Truth Be Told, and I'm Lucinda Bassett, and this is LA Live. The number is 323-247-7443, and we're actually talking with um, Dr. Archer about uh, ADHD, and I just wanted to just take a few minutes, and Dr. Archer, tell us about your first book and also the book that's coming out again. Uh, The first book is called Better Than Normal, How What Makes You Different Can Make You Exceptional, and in that book, I look at eight so-called psychiatric diagnoses, which... uh, I then portray occurring as a trait along a continuum from one to 10. And so some of the the traits would be schizophrenia, bipolar, social anxiety, anxiety, narcissism, histrionic, uh, generalized anxiety, and ADHD actually uh, is in there. And I say that on the Continuum, if you're at a 9 or a 10 or a 10 plus, and there's a very strong likelihood you have a diagnosable psychiatric illness that needs to be addressed. But if you're in the 5 to 8 range, mm-hmm. then this could in turn be an inherent strength that if you leverage can actually work for you. Let me ask you so something. In, in that book, is a person, is the reader able to kind of, and I, I, I don't like to use this word, but self-diagnose. In other words, well, gee, I'm only on, I'm, a, I'm on a level 4. So yes. I pr- there's a self there's eight traits and so at the end of the book there's a self assessment quiz Perfect. for each of the eight traits where Great. you you actually get your number on all eight from wow. one to ten wow and uh, so then you know there's pointers inside the book depending on where you fall if you want you don't have to read the whole book you just go and say oh well I've got a you know I'm very high in anxiety so let me go read about anxiety or I'm high in ADHD wow. let me go read about that. What prompted me to write the second book, which actually is not out, I'm in the process of writing it right now, um, was the fact that the ADHD chapter was the one which got uh, the overwhelming response. So everyone was responding more to ADHD than the others. I thought, you know what, that really needs a lot more um, information and I could I could turn that into a book. And mm-hmm. so uh, that's what I'm doing. Well, I'm really excited to read both of your books, and I'm excited. That first book sounds like it should be in every classroom, in every <laughs> teacher's you know, pocket across the country. Um, certainly, if you're a parent who, who is struggling with, with a teenager or you know, a, a grade school child, or even if you're an adult wondering, you know, pick up the book. Where's the book available? Who's the publishing company? Uh, it's Random House, and uh, it's available you know, on Amazon, at your local bookstore, barnesandnoble.com, pretty we, much anywhere that books are sold. Well, I mean, uh, for how, how lovely to be able to go pick up a book and read through and, and understand, hey, you know, my, my, my child is, is pretty severe, or you know what, this isn't that severe, and, and I'm going to take um, some of this advice and, and help my child organically. Or, you know, no, he's pretty severe, I need to take him to a professional and, and maybe see if he might need some medication. But but I think uh, the good news is there are a lot of great things that come from these people who are who don't fit into you know a, a square a square hole. And I I have a son who's one of them, and he's brilliant, he's lovely and um, amazing. And I want to thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> and um, I wish you well on your second book, Dr. Archer. And uh, thanks for your time, and thanks for joining us on Truth Be Told. Thank you so much, Lucinda. All right, I take really care. appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. All right, we're going to be joined. I think we have another caller. Um, Our caller is um, Alex. Are you there? 
Are you with us? Oh, Alex? Uh, yeah. Hey, Hello. hi. Um, Alex, so it's my understanding that you are someone who spent um, some years growing up through life, going through school with ADHD? Uh, yeah, ADD, actually. Okay, and so ADD? Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell me your story. What 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 happened with you? Well, when I was in second grade, um, but my teachers, I guess, didn't like my behavior, or didn't think I was learning as well as I could be, and so she recommended me to see the school neurologist, and then I eventually went to a neurologist, and then was they didn't really exactly know what I had. They never closely diagnosed it, but it was like something closely related to ADD. And they prescribed me like Ritalin and Adderall and a bunch of different uh, types of drugs that I don't know. I never really think that they did anything. I always like had rashes and stuff and I always had constant insomnia. But I took that up through sixth grade and was in the resource program um, forever. And then when I got to high school, I wanted to like take AP classes and stuff and they wouldn't let me because I was in the resource program and I had an IEP. And so eventually I got signed out of that and made my way through the AP program. Wow. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. We need that. Now it needs applause. No, because really, um, first of all, that's that's really amazing that you were an IEP is independent educational program. Those are um, that was my battle, you know. So, so um, what happens? Did you say you were in the second grade when you started the medications, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. Second grade. And and, and what were you doing that that your mom or dad decided and teachers decided you might need some medication? What were some of the symptoms? Were you not? It, how was your handwriting? Could you sit still in class? How were your grades in the second grade? Well, I didn't have the best handwriting, and I'm sure I had trouble sitting still. Um, and I don't think I was doing that well in the class at the time, but I mean, I was seven and what seven year old can sit still? Well, uh, and that's true. And so then when you got to be in the fifth grade, I'm assuming, so here you were, you'd been on these medications for a couple years. And do you yeah. remember, do you remember how those medications made you feel? I mean, I loved, you said, first of all, first of all, they don't, you don't want to eat. So my son got thin and then you can't sleep because they're stimulants. So then at night you're laying there kind of, you can't sleep and then you don't feel good the next day because then, and then you go back on the stimulants. And, um, yeah. I mean, and, and I think it may, remember you have to go to the nurse's office to take your medication. Remember that? Yeah. And that's embarrassing. There's a, there's a kind of a stigma associated with that, right? Yeah. I am so I just like hated the part where I could never sleep. That was, I would always like, be awake all night. My mom would be like, how come you never go to sleep? And now I'm like, oh, it's because I was on stimulants. Maybe it's those when drugs you're seven. giving me. <laughs> <laughs> No, and you know it's not funny, but the reason that I think that we can laugh together, you and I, is because you know yeah. you're out there. And how old are you now? I'm 23. And so, and so you, so you went into, you got through high school without medication, mm-hmm. and went into AP yeah. classes. Yeah, my last two years of high school, I took AP wow, classes. that is amazing. You know, and and AP classes for those of you who don't know are the more difficult classes that college bound kids choose so that they can get into better colleges or, you know, get into college and they're hard. And, um, did you end up going to college? I went to community college and I'm actually in my last semester, hopefully transferred next semester. Yay. Look at you. (laughs) And are you using any of these meds in college? No, I'm not. I'm no longer in the IEP program. Wow. Uh, nor do I receive any assistance from the school. Wow. And and did did your mom or your dad play a significant role in helping you uh, break away from the meds and become that that uh, independent educationally, or did you really kind of just figure it out on your own? Well, I um, I had to have my mom sign off on everything, but I kind of stopped wanting to take the medication, and then I got personally like interested in school and wanted to do. And once I want to start, like, getting out of those classes, because it's kind of hard to succeed in those classes because you're surrounded by a bunch of kids that really just don't care and don't want to go anywhere. And, Uh you know, the teachers kind of always have to cater to the slowest person in the class. So when I wanted to get into the more advanced classes, I needed my mom to help me as far as, like, signing me into it goes. 
yeah, obviously, but you're you're the one who was motivated to get out of the IEP classes and the special needs classes and go to a regular classroom and do the work. You wanted to move to that level. Yeah. And then did you have a tutor at home? Uh, I went to the Sullivan Learning Center for like a oh, year. Oh, okay. This is um, an ad for Sullivan Learning Center. After that, it was all <laughs> on me. I'm sorry. How how did that work for you, Sullivan Learning Center? It was good. It, I I needed help with math, and they yeah. definitely helped me with math. But I I didn't need it after a year. Wow. And what grade was that? How old were you then? Sophomore year, I started that. Hmm. Tenth grade. Well, um, I am really, really proud of you uh, as a mommy. You know, um, I'm really happy for you that you've made made it this far and you're doing so well, and that you, you know, that you took it upon yourself to say, I, I, I can do better than this. You know, and I want to step back into a regular program and give it a try. Did you get? And then you did AP classes. I can't even imagine that you could do that. I mean, I also think there's an advantage now and. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a time at poor Sammy when he was going through a lot of this. So much had to be written by hand. Now you have a computer. Yeah. So if your handwriting's bad, I mean, my son on a computer, he's a wizard. I mean, he can top like 100 words, you know, per I don't know what minute, but he's good. And and that that really made a difference for him when he could start doing everything on a computer. And now you can take a laptop. You know, you don't have to be one of those kids who has to write a five-page paper by hand when you can't because you yeah. have, you know, when it's hard for you. How, did you say you, your handwriting was bad or no? Oh, I have terrible handwriting, and I still do. But, I mean, right now, like as you already said, I pretty much type everything. Everything. to be turned yeah. in. Well, you know, I just want to say, because we're going to go here pretty soon, but um, I hope you had a chance to listen to um, to Dr. Archer because – I was just really um, excited about his his point of view, and the point of view is that everybody's unique, everyone is different. The idea is to embrace your your uniqueness, and you know when it, when you get out there in the real world at 25 and you're making your way, it doesn't matter whether or not you're a good handwriter because you just get on your computer. What matters about is how smart you are, how creative you are, how willing you are to work because you do right. Unfortunately, this is an extremely competitive world we live in these days, and you have to be able to work. And you have to be able to get out there, do the work, and be creative, and 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 take some chances. But you know, so many people, so many successful, wealthy people in the world started out with ADD, ADHD, bipolar disorder, anxiety, um, dysgraphia, dyslexia, all those things. And now they're you know producers. <laughs> they own major companies. Um, so anything is possible. It's really about you know, how big of a dream you have and how willing you are to go after it. So, and to be really clear about what you want, but Alex, it sounds like you're on your way. Thank you so much for calling in today. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. I am so glad you joined us here today on Truth Be Told. We just had the truth be told to us about ADHD. And the, the, the truth is this, you are capable, you are strong, you are full of potential for greatness. And so just make sure you surround yourself with the people that believe in you. And if somebody's in your life who doesn't believe to you, believe in you, get them out of there. And, uh, and uh, pick up um, Dr. Archer's book. And um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Lucinda Bassett. This is Truth Be Told. And I'm on LA Live. And the number here is 323-247-7443. Join us next time on Truth Be Told.
tuned into LA Talk Live we're more than just talk don't go anywhere stay tuned You are now tuned into LA Talk Live. We're more than just talk. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Are you ready to enjoy 